many people turned up to a talk in a city that I've never spoken in before. Being that it's about politics, which means that most of you might be suffering from such things. Uh, I have to imagine, unfortunately, that um, it is because you are suffering from politics somewhere or you've experienced it to a degree. And human beings, they're the problem, aren't they? Yeah? If we could just get them nice and logical, that would be nice. But they're not that obedient, are they? So I guess that's um, what my talk is about. So my name's Catherine Kirk, and I'm doing a talk about politics and hierarchy, which is a, quite, a, quite a subject to tackle. Um, I consider myself to be an insight facilitator, and I don't say that as a big huggy thing. Um, so I'm an independent consultant, and I get drawn into really tough scenarios. So an odd thing about me is that I was brought up in an Aboriginal tribe because my parents were hippies. So I think about things very, very differently, and that's turned into a career. So that means that um, although I have done things like, um, you know, the traditional, or if you could call it traditional, lean agile stuff, with Scrum or Kanban, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with um, development teams. Eventually, as we managed to make a difference with what we were doing, transforming team by team, I ended up working with divisions and then people started saying, could you go and sort people upstairs because they're being real pains in the beep. And uh, so that's where I've sort of settled for some time. But the trick to what I do is that I realize that I better get out of the way. That's the thing I learned very quickly. Get out of the way, Catherine. And that's what I call insight facilitation. In other words, I don't have the answer. Wherever I go, those people will have the answer because they have the context, they have the knowledge. It's up to me to work out how I can in facilitate insight in them. Because sometimes people get stressed and fatigued and their viewpoint narrows. So therefore, they don't see the obvious. Okay, so perhaps that's all I do is help people see the obvious. Co-discovery, um, because I had uh, a medical condition which affected my brain and I actually ended up losing a bit of memory. So I had to take a position, I was halfway through my masters in software engineering at Oxford and this happened to me and I had to take the position after I lost this knowledge of co-discovering everything. So when I went back to consulting I couldn't be the person with the answer and in the end I became the co-discoverer. And weirdly, this made me more successful. Can you believe it? There you go. So I've learnt my lesson. My ego is supposed to be down here. Um, and so I focus primarily on transformation in tech because that's where I grew up. And so that's where I sit. But now, as I said, I'm more um, at the leadership level, trying to help those guys wake up a little bit to the new context. Uh, which, you know, the World Economic Forum calls the fourth industrial revolution, echo, echo, echo. Great. That's my introduction done. So, this talk is about the hell that we often find ourselves in, and this is an area of speciality that I've had, and I do weird things in this space. So, you can probably track some of my really crappy talks, way back to 2009 even, where I'm talking about politics, and I tell you, I've evolved, all right, so don't judge me. And, we've, and uh, the difference that I have, um, the different approach that I've taken is I translate Eastern philosophical models into practical techniques. And as soon as people hear that, they think gimmick. Yeah, that's just a little bit hippy trippy. But the truth of it is that there are, uh, there is wisdom that's like two and a half thousand years old that can be of value uh, to tech, believe it or not in a very, very practical way, not let's go hug. I'm talking practical. So that's what I'm going to try and link it up. But I'm not going to bore you with any of those models. I just wanted to make sure that you knew you were in for something a little different so that you had a chance to go to another talk if that, was, if, if that scared you a little, yeah? OK, so the hell we are in, as you saw in the little blurb, we've often had that heavy disappointment because we join what we think is an empowered team, right? We're all pumped up, and maybe it's our first time working with Lean Agile, so we're looking forward to learning that. And uh, maybe we've heard great things, it's great tech, it's great people. And yet after a while, we notice, ah, politics is here. And hierarchy, although perhaps not in a traditional sense, it's kind of there, right? Where some, they've got the cool kids, and then you've got the not so cool kids, and then you've got the idiots. 
There's, there's a hierarchy even if there's flat management. And then when you dig around for it, sometimes you think there's no logical reason for this. We just need to deliver. What's going on? And then you start thinking, I'll try some stuff. So you do, perhaps. Maybe you shut down. But the thing is, it doesn't seem to stop. It doesn't seem to ever stop. So if you've been frustrated with that, no matter what you do with those political games that confuse and muddy the waters, one of the big things you need to do is understand why is it happening. If you understand why it's happening, you can develop a method yourself. You can be empowered to work out how to get out. But sometimes we don't know. So I figure I have an idea of what is happening. So that's all I'm going to share with you. It's just an idea. I'm not telling you that when you walk out of here, what I said is the bee's knees, as they call it. I'm just saying <laughs> it's an opinion and it's a proven method or a proven viewpoint that I've had for a number of years. Help me out. Yep. So I just want to share it. And that's pretty much why I come and do conference talks. So, is everything hopeless? That's what we want to know. So what I'm going to do is uh, look at how we create politics and hierarchy. I'm going to do this very quickly. Don't be stressed. Because I, I want to actually focus on the why. That's what I'm more interested in. So I'm going to talk about two assumptions that we make that cause the why. Then I'm going to examine why it happens and how it happens. And then look at is there anything really that we can do about it or should we just leave the company or dissolve it if we own it? Yeah? And I'm going to, because I always try, to make sure that there is at least one practical suggestion and there's something that you could go to work tomorrow and go, all right, I might try this thing. Yeah? So if I don't do that, you can come over and tell me off and I'll, I'll rejig. After. Okay? After. So, how to create politics. This is how you create politics. It's a pattern I've noticed. It's based on Eastern philosophical models that I will not bore you with, okay? Here we are. Firstly, have a lot of self-pity. Poor me, yeah? Look at everybody else. They've got everything else except for me. I'm stuck here doing this thing, right? Even serial killers are good at this. A lot of self-pity. I don't know, I just killed it again and again because my mum and my dad. Entitlement. Walk around thinking everything that everybody else has, you should have. Right, that's going to build up a bit of political ammunition inside of you. Dominica, you have a lovely shirt. I should have that. Now we are having a political scenario, right? Envy. Oh, I might as well focus again on Dominica. <laughs> She's finished her book. I'm still writing mine. I'm envious. So this creates politics. It makes us objectify other people and separate ourselves out. Right? And we become so busy fighting for the things that we want. Right? We're envying the things we haven't got. Mm -hmm. what we think we should be entitled to, and we're fighting so hard to get attention, excuse me, excuse me, right, that actually we lose what we already have. And we lose our value in the bigger picture. We don't realise how much value we might have. So we start operating in this way because we go, oh, look, I like that, and oh, it's so horrible for me, and oh, look over there, I should have that. That's what we fill our minds with, and then we forget the things we have got. Now, how to create hierarchy? Well, hierarchy is much simpler. Okay, so the way you can do that is have ambition. As soon as you meet somebody, as soon as you get into a situation, just sit back and say, I want to be their boss. Mm -hmm. I think I should be in charge. I got a better idea, yeah? Or, you know, I'll ride my time and then eventually I will become the lead. And this creates an atmosphere, not of sharing, but you sort of sitting back there, getting nice and ambitious, political play. You see where, where I'm heading? And the other thing you can do is compete, competition. 
So somebody does some code and you go, I can do so much better than that. I'm telling you now, that's not bonding, okay? That's, that's conflict. That's the beginnings of conflict. That's the beginnings of boundaries. Yep. Our team is so much more awesome than that team. Or our team is going to get so much, awesome, much more awesome than the other team. Putting yourself, pitting yourselves up. I would like to go to an organization where two teams are exactly the same. I would like to. I would like to see that. I have never in my life ever seen two teams exactly the same that could compete exactly the same. Right? We are so diverse. Everything is so interdependent. Everything is so different that it's ridiculous for teams to compete against each other. Right? The combination of individuals is so unique. Can't possibly be re replicated in another, let alone code. Right? Competition, in my personal view, a little fruitless in the tech industry-ish. Again, when you're creating that, the effect of hierarchy is that you're fighting for privilege. You're fighting to be special. You're fighting for you or your group to be better, to have more. And then you wonder why you degrade relationships that you'll need later. Then you wonder why people don't trust you, why the trust is degrading around you. Then you wonder why the company's kind of got this culture of suspicion, passive aggression. That's pretty much how you create hierarchies. Now, how it affects delivery. Imagine a car engine and all these amazing objects working together to run a car. Now imagine if every single one of those parts decided to play politics and hierarchy. How well would that engine run? Let's just say all the parts are really good, wonderful parts and they're in the right position. But they all decided to go, hang on a minute, I'm going to get advantage. How productive would it be? You see, a human system is similar, but more, of course, complex because humans don't even obey or do what it is they're supposed to do, right? If you have politics and hierarchy at each collaboration and interaction, that causes delay and degradation of data. Data being maybe strategy, data being maybe information about risk that would affect strategy. And this, in turn, delays or reduces the quality of delivery. It's important. We need to get a handle on politics and hierarchy. It's okay to have a bit. We are human beings, right? If you watch rabbits in the spring, you'll see the little baby ones trying to play get on the log. You ever seen that? So you have a group of little rabbits, they're playing, and then one will try and get on the log, and it's like, I am here. I have made it. And all the others are like, come on, get off. I've got to have, I've got to get on the log. What's a log got to do with a tiny rabbit? They don't eat it. It's not a house. It's just a game of hierarchy. It's kind of a little bit of politics. So we are built to do that. And there is an element of it that is healthy. But when it starts to cause terrible harm or affect delivery, we have a problem and we need to solve it. We need to know what to do about it. So what's happening here? So this is what I've been interested in and why I went into Eastern philosophy. Because I'm thinking to myself, well, great, I can see how politics arises and I could sit there and try and counsel every damn person, you know, don't have so much self-pity. You know, that would be popular, wouldn't it? Don't, don't have entitlement. Don't have envy. Don't have ambition. Don't have competition. Okay, that's, that's going nowhere, right? I'm not going to get successful with that. So I thought, well, what's happening and how can we deal with it? And these are... Uh, a couple of things, a couple of mistakes that I've seen over years that I see us making. Two assumptions. I like to simplify things. Assumption one, I am the center of the universe. If you've ever stated that, nobody else is going to agree with you. Everybody thinks they're the center of the universe. As soon as you start behaving as though you are, Everybody else is going to go, mm-mm, I am. So as soon as you do that, you're in conflict. Now, the only time that people agree, perhaps, someone else is the center of the universe, is if they've, like, got more power. So they just shut up. They just go, oh, yes, I, yes, 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 you are the center of the universe. But that's really because they think they're the center of the universe and they've got to get what they need out of you. It might be promotion, money, permanent position. 
And the way that we, the way that we kind of demonstrate that we're the centre of the universe is that we take our own point of view as unquestioned. I can judge, but no one can judge me. Yeah. We believe that we can determine what outcome is best for me. All right, without context. You could just say, you know what, I think I should be promoted. I do. Forgetting the fact that perhaps you don't have the experience or perhaps there's somebody else that's better at it or perhaps that there's another pathway for you or perhaps it's nothing you're talented in. Oh no, I've decided that I should be promoted. And you aim for short-term results that are always in your favour. You know? So you don't tend to aim for the long-term gain. And why do we do that? We do that because... It's very simple. We're not mean, horrible, nasty people. We want to make it easier for ourselves. It's just a little bit easier to be thinking about me and not worrying about everybody else, isn't it? Right? I'm just going to focus here. So then we can say stuff like, hmm, look at that problem. God, fixing that. That's hopeless. It's too big. <laughs> Thank God it's not my problem. Right? So now we're off the hook. I just have to worry about me. It's nice and simple. Thank you very much. The danger of this assumption is if you do it long enough, the weird thing happens. You become isolated. You feel out of touch. You feel misunderstood. You feel as if people are not listening. They don't see your point of view. Because you've just said, I'm not a part of that. I'm, I'm the center of the universe here. So then after a while, that becomes a big space. And the side effect is you can become defensive. I am an island. I must fight for myself. Every time I come into an interaction, I must make sure that I take care of me. Now, if someone does that, in any situation, the other person, Dominica, is going to say the same thing. Well... If you are just going to take care of yourself, I'm going to take care of myself too. And so we're in this conflict. This is before we've even started, you know, negotiating perhaps, or trying to befriend each other and have a drink. So assumption two that we have is that there is an us and there is a them. That's our second assumption that we make. So this is how we create hierarchy. So in this case, we do similar things. We say, I'm going to take the group's point of view as unquestioned, because I'm part of a cool club now, so, you know. I'm going to determine what outcome is best for my team. I don't care about the division. I don't care about the company. And I'm going to aim for short-term results in the group's favor. Now, why, how do we create a group if we think we're the center of the universe? Hmm. The way we do that is we realize that we're a bit lonely alone, yeah? So I realize, even though I know I am the center of the universe, I need a companion with this. So I say, Dominique, you know, please, uh, you know, I'm the center of the universe and everything, um, so, but do you want to help me get my agenda? And she goes, well, I know she's not the center of the universe because I am, but there's some advantage of me uniting at this point. Yeah, yeah, sure, right? So that's how you can create a group. Or you can actually have fear. You're all frightened something's going to happen. You've all got a common enemy. So you group together and you say, all right, let's help each other. Get this agenda together. Not a bad intention. But if you start then applying worth to that, saying, because we're worth more than that team, we're worth more than the division, we're worth more than the company, that's a hierarchy, right? So lean agile teams sometimes do that, don't they? They say, we're lean and agile, right? Fighting for the cause, rolling out transformation. So then they add the next bit, because the first bit's a fact. Six, next bit is, so we are like more advanced. We're kind of better. And the people that don't do lean agile are not so good. That's a hierarchy. So the intention is to create a club to belong to, to get help. You know, we're devs. We don't mind testers. They're level two. Level two coolness. We're level one coolness. Well, we hate BAs. They're on the outside. Yeah, that's a hierarchy. 
And we do that because it feels better, we feel united, got a community, those things are to do with them. We can differentiate from problems. God, those testers are idiots. I like them, but they're idiots. The BAs are completely, I just can't stand them, right? Thank God it's not my problem. So we only get to worry about what affects us. Again, it's a self-defense mechanism. The danger of this assumption is if you do it long enough, because if you do it for a while, it can be to your advantage. You suddenly don't feel connected to the rest of the organisation, of course, because you keep making boundaries of them and, and us, right? So that means you're not, you're not establishing that you're all interconnected, you're establishing that you're all separate parts in competition with each other. And the side effect of that, after a while, is that you begin to split away from the full view of why the company is there or why the division is there or why are the products that you're working on and you have this side effect that you are doing less meaningful work. It doesn't feel like I'm coming into work to do something amazing, you know? Or you think what we do is really, really meaningful, but what other people do is a heap of crap. Again, hierarchy. And that creates resentment if you're competing and ambitious. And sometimes a level of arrogance because, you know, our stuff is super meaningful. What do you do? We do IPTV. We do mobile. Ooh. See, what does that mean? That's an extra meaning we add in. So we can sometimes take an aggressive stance, even before we've even spoken to certain people in the organization, at meetings. I'm coming in, and I'm defending, and I'm fighting for our group, because to me, this is better. We're better. That's politics and hierarchy. So why do we do this when we actually know better? We know this stuff. You can tell, you know, self-pity is a pit of hell. It doesn't really help. It's not very empowering. Envy, etc., entitlement. Thinking yourself, thinking that you are the center of the universe. There's a few people around that might show you you're not. You know, creating politics and hierarchy. Why do we do it? Well, there's a bigger picture at play, so you have to have a little forgiveness here. It's called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. You can look it up on the World Economic Forum, um, which is just a description of what the IT... So th that's the business world catching up a little slow to what the Lean Agile community and the tech community have known for quite a while, which is it's all speeding up, it's getting chaotic, and everything is interconnected and complex and ambiguous. <gasps> really? Goodness. Okay. Thank you, Professor Schwab. Um, that's the founder of the World Economic Forum that wrote the book, Fourth Industrial Revolution, just so you know. That's not a medical term. Um, so complexity, for instance, is, is increased. Globalization, security, right? Not one person has the answer. Not one person has the answer. We're all having to lean on each other to get the insights to get the knowledge, to get the context, because it's so complex, it's ever-changing, it's interdependent, and therefore very dissatisfying to work with. But we've learnt, as a tech industry, to adapt, to collaborate, and to iterate, which is all fine, until this damn thing, Fourth Industrial Revolution, which I think Deloitte, Deloitte and Forbes, I think, renamed as, wait for it, Industry 4.0, echo, 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 <laughs> yeah? Then this arises, speeds everything up. What happens when everything speeds up? Right, well, collaborations have to increase and the complexity of systems increases because we're working at speed and we're not cleaning stuff up and we're not getting enough time to think. Plus, if we add globalization and security and those types of things, doing the simplest thing can end up being the most complex thing of all time. I'm sure some of you have touched on that in your jobs. And the people are the little conduits that are doing the work and communicating. So no piece of work just suddenly appears magically upon this carpet in front of us. It's done by someone, right? And it's not just done by one person, it's done by a group. So that means something, some group had to collaborate to make that happen. And if they had to do it fast and it was really complex, what happens? What happens then? Because that's what's happening. 
we're getting overwhelmed. Everything is about faster, more, now, yesterday. Good God. And then, it's not like once, it's not like twice, it's not like a couple of times a year, or you know, you get like three or four days during the month where it's like, yeah, all right, just have a bit of break, clean up some code, do some stuff. That's not happening. It's all of the time. Continuous delivery, continuous improvement, continuous innovation. I have done a talk, I think, I don't know how long ago it was. Continuous improvement is hell on earth. Yeah? That's the truth of it, because it never ends. You're never, never, never good enough. You don't get a pattern. It's like, and how could you improve that? And how could you improve that? And how could you? It's like, oh, my God, I've had enough. I need a holiday. Yeah? That's what continuousness feels like. And we were like, oh, yeah, I love the idea of continuous. It's so cool. I was like, no, it's not. It's exhausting. So we get things like decision fatigue, collaboration fatigue, empathy fatigue, change fatigue, because we're not getting a break. <laughs> it's just constantly upon us over and over and over again. So uh, Obama, I think in his, uh, his first 100 days video or series, he actually uses the techniques from decision fatigue to protect how many decisions he makes in order to ensure that he keeps to focused. Have a, have a look at that. Collaboration fatigue, obviously, you can imagine what that is. And I bet you there's a ton of you that feel it. Not again, not another collaboration. How many more? Yeah? Actually, in this new environment, many more. Empathy fatigue. Identifying with other people is a good thing until what you identify is as self-destructive. Dominica, I'm sorry, but you've become apathetic. And I identify with that because, you know, why compete with me, yeah? But then I become apathetic, yeah? Because I'm identifying with her. Apathy breeds apathy if you're too empathic with it. So there's a catch-22 with this whole idea of let's have lots of empathy in teams. There's an answer to that. It's an Eastern philosophical answer, and it's called compassion. Um, and it's called differentiating just that little bit from the situation. I'm not going to go into it because it's not part of the talk. I'll just let you know. You can look it up. And change fatigue. Everything's changing, everything's changing, everything's changing, everything's changing, everything's... Oh, my God, I've had enough. Yeah? Constant change. It's too much. And we get so overwhelmed, so overwhelmed, that we reduce our sphere of caring. That's all that we're doing. We're just going, I cannot care about all this that's happening around me. And so in that state of stress and fatigue, we pull it in close. We start just looking at what's in front of my feet, yeah? Thing is, if we're under that pressure for a very long period of time, which is starting to occur, right, we don't get breaks, we start to develop bad habits. Because it's okay when you're under stress to think about you. It's kind of like a protection thing. I'm sorry, I can't help you. I'm going to go and I'm going to have a rest or I'm going to have a holiday or I'm going to leave. <laughs> But over time, if we keep thinking we're the center of the universe and we keep mobbing into groups and we keep turning it into hierarchy, this becomes a habit. And we become used to thinking that we're the center of the universe and that we need to create clubs and that we need to think that we're the center of the universe and we need hierarchies to survive. It's not true, but we think it to be that way because it's a habitual reaction. And unfortunately, reaction determines outcome, doesn't it, right? So every time we react in this way, it reinforces the politics and the hierarchy. So if you're not careful, you might be unconsciously perpetuating the thing you hate. <laughs> Great. So let's have a look at an example here. It's a very, very simple example. So a person comes to you and says, <clears throat> I am the center of the universe. And uh, here's your two choices. If you agree, you just made a hierarchy. <laughs> just saying there, got a higher standing than you. If you disagree, you've just started politics because you're about to conflict. So is there any possible way out of that then, if that's your only option? Well, of course it's not your only option. You have to understand that if you re-act, you recreate the same situation 
and the same culture. So your reaction is what reinforces. So what are we missing when we're creating politics? This underlying assumption, I am the centre of the universe, neglects to utilise the power of response, the power of persistent response. Consider this, right? Have you ever been in a team where one person arrives and messes that whole team up? And it was amazing before that person turned up. That's an example of the power of one person. Yeah? Or have you seen a division or another group where one person turned up and they turned around? That's the power of one person. Why is that person not you? Well, you're sitting in that team. You wait for someone else to come in and change it. Why is it not you? It's an interesting question. What are we missing when we create hierarchy? Well, the underlying assumption is that we have to create, create thems and us's. But this neglects to see how much all of us matter, right? And what we can all achieve together. It does not see the system as a whole. It sees the system in parts, right? So you need to consider the value that everyone brings. Very systems thinking, but from a human point of view. Right? What value does this person? So, as I said, someone has to respond to this differently. We have to give a different reaction, but because we talked, as we spoke about, habitual issues come up, we need to do it persistently over time. You can't stand there and do one effort to stop politics and it didn't work and go, well, that's me done then because we are under that horrible thing called continuousness. So if you want to change the situation around you, you need to continuously respond differently. That's how you turn the tide. That's hard, sorry. Right? I'm sorry, but that is hard. So let's go back to this example. Person comes to you and says, I am the center of the universe. Right? Remember, if you agree, you've just created a hierarchy. If you disagree, you're starting politics. Is there another way out? Yes. Move the focus. Right? Move the focus from the relationship between you and that person to where you and that person add value in the whole system. Right? Because you are, when you're at work, you are valued parts of a vast ecosystem. You have to be, or you'd be sacked. You have to have been doing something of value. So, for instance, we had the devs of the cool club, testers are okay and BAs are idiots, hierarchy. But what happens if we just said, well, de devs add value this way, testers add value this way, BAs add value this way, what would happen? Could we agree? You see, this is not about hugging Remember I said it, I know that the words I use often are like hippie trippy and people do think that it's all about hugging when it comes to me, but you'll find out pretty quick if you hire me, that's not the case. Practical application in this case could be simple as visualise your system. Visualise the workflow if there's lots of conflict in politics. Visualise collaboration, but as you get the wider view, acknowledge the value that each of those people provide. And it's not going to hurt. Appreciate it. Just appreciate it. That shifts the energy from instant conflict to, oh wow, and it does this magical thing. It interconnects us to a greater community. That thing we actually crave inside so very much to be a part of a meaningful, big community. Weird. Agreeing that we have value in a bigger system is easier to agree on than who is most important and which group is most special. Just a hint. So but if you're going to go into some sort of negotiation that's political, just have a think about that. How could you show that everyone provides value? Rather than try to decipher, decipher who is most important, because meetings can die for that reason. They can just run for hours where some people are posturing just to work out who's most important and which group is most special. Which priority is this project? Well, we were last week and we should stay this week because. So just a very quick recap. 
reasons for politics, politic making, the assumption that I am at the centre of the universe, the reason for hierarchy creation, the assumption that there is an us versus them. And why do we do that? We do that because of stress, fatigue, and number one, habitual reaction from stress, fatigue, or negative cultures in previous places of work or the current place of work over long periods of time. How do we remedy that? We identify, acknowledge, and appreciate the value that people bring, including yourself. It might be a bad habitual reaction as to why people are behaving the way they are, so persist. Don't give up. It takes a while to change habits and to change culture. Why persist? Well, if you do what you've always done, it can be difficult and the chance for, um, for a new outcome is zero. If you do something different, it can be difficult, but the chance for a new outcome is likely. If you do something different consistently, right, there's the tricky word there, it can be very difficult, I'm not denying that, but it's a chance for a new outcome and that's very, very likely. So in conclusion, how do we do? So, how do we create politics and hierarchy? Self-pity, entitlement, envy, ambition and competition. Why? We make two assumptions, that we're the centre of the universe, that there's a them and an us. We, um, how does that happen? Through stress, fatigue and habitual reaction. Is there anything we can do about it? Yes, let's change our reaction and persist with that change of reaction. At least one practical suggestion, visualise your system, show value of the humans in it, the humans, okay, not just the work. And what you can do tomorrow, well, if you find yourself in a political or hierarchical situation, perhaps you could just acknowledge and focus on people's and your own value and see if that breaks that confrontation that's kicked off. So don't give in to the temptation. You are not the centre of the universe. In fact, you're a part of one... Oh, sorry, except for Dominica. She's just confirmed she is. Um, if I say yes... <laughs> Uh, there is no them and us, not really. Because if you think this way, you're in danger of becoming isolated. You can, I've found people that can become depressed. Uh, you also are in danger that you start to believe you have meaningless work or others have meaningless work and you can't see the value in others, which then falls on you. And the reality is, you and your group are not better than anybody else. You just do different things. Don't forget that even though you try to pretend you are the isolated and in really cool groups, you're already a part of a big, huge community. And you matter because you wouldn't be in your job if you didn't. And so step back and see how interconnected you really are. Value the sum of all of those parts because you're a valued member, really. You are. You just need to wake up and do something about it. Because the benefits are, on delivery, is that if you can communicate better, if you've got less politics and hierarchy, then you can de-risk much better, right? Because techs can get together to look at different systems. Uh, managers can come down and have conversations with techs much more easily, right? You can take advantage of opportunity, or difficulty actually, create opportunity. Increase the likelihood of things that you are going to benefit you and your organisation. You can boost results and of course increase speed and accuracy of the collaboration system. Okay, not the technical system, the collaboration system. And how it communicates risk and strategy. So pay this knowledge forward, please, if you can. Be first, all right? Be a pioneer. Reach out, appreciate acknowledge, see value if you can with everybody, with all the teams and persist with that because you really truly can make a difference. Thank you very much. I don't know what time we've got left. Five minutes. Five minutes. Any questions? Oh, okay. Oh my God, here we go. Oh, here we go. Hang on. Because I talk about weird things, the questions aren't normal. So here's one. Oh. How can we set aside our ego and be more agreeable when the reward structure seems to favor those who trump up their visibility? This seems to punish collaborators. So how do we 
Say that again. How do we? How can we set aside our ego and be more agreeable? How can we set aside our ego and be more agreeable when it's set up to fail? I think it's about providing insight in each other. If you become aware of the system doing that to the relationships that you're in, you can then acknowledge why behaviour is the way it is. And some people stop what they're doing because they realise it's all a big play. That's one of the key factors that I've, I've found helps. So you know that you're in a hierarchical system and you know that it's driving you to play politics with each other. But you also can be then aware, if everybody's aware of it, that you're not going to play the game. But that does mean that slowly you have to kind of start with a few people that aren't going to be, excuse the language, assholes, right? You have to kind of work with your little circle uh, and wider and wider and wider. Your, your circle of influence, I think, is, is what it is. Uh, you can't change the legal structures, you can't change the financial structures, but you can have insight on how you can flip situations, transform situations for the betterment of the whole. Yeah. And uh, Dan and I did a talk about swarming, and that's some practical examples of how you might want to do that. Any other questions? Yeah. So this is about organisational size. Organisation? Size. Size. Would you say politics differ across organisational size? No. This is a weird thing. My God, I got uh, called up by, I hope they don't mind me saying, I won't say the name. Um, so I'm like working in large organisations, BBC, The Economist, you know, places like that, and we're dealing with politics and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so a friend of mine um, got promoted and, uh, in a startup, and he's, you know, gone off to another country. So it's about, uh, I think it's 80 people, the company. He calls me up and he goes, oh my God. <laughs> I'm thinking, what could possibly be, be wrong? He starts describing it to me. I'm like, good Lord, there's more politics in those 80 people than there was in the division of 200 I just, just was helping out. And actually, it's the case. You know, um, small teams, it's, it's the amount of emotion and the amount of hierarchy and the amount of you know, habitual reaction, the amount of pressure that team is on can produce exceptionally spectacular dysfunctional behaviour. <laughs> and that can occur in a small company and it can occur in a big one. It seems to be... Politics is politics. And the upside of that is you still can fix it the same way. So you can do one team at a time or small groups at a time in a large organisation. It's the same when you, when you do a small organisation. I hope that answers that question. Any other questions that's not on the app? Uh -huh. Ah, brilliant. So I come from a pretty small organization, 150 people. Um, we're currently going through a lot of this acknowledgement of our politics. You've gone from, what, what is it, 80 to, where's that limit? And then all of a sudden politics gets to be held. Yeah. yeah. So most of the organization is pretty agile, except for two folks at the way top. Oh, yes, my, so my new <laughs> friends. Yes, yes. What do you do in that situation? All right. I have a lot of techniques in that space. But um, my advice is that... Um, you help them have insight about the fourth industrial revolution is what you do. Okay, because that's all their peers. There's a wonderful photo of poor, uh, poor, um, you know, Donald Trump being forced to go to, you know, the World Economic Forum and, uh, and get told about these, uh, you know, the fourth industrial revolution. That's, that's obviously going to be the peer set for your two people. So one of the things that I recommend, <coughs> what, what I recommend is, have an open day or some kind of day where you ask the question, are we industry 4.0 ready? Echo, 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 yeah? Now, this is in corporate language, obviously, and you might want to pull up that Deloitte Forbes report, hand it over to your mates there, your two best friends, and then say, come to the party. We're all going to talk about how we're going to be productive and useful and effective in this new context that is arising. And once they see the leadership techniques that are required for that, which is empathy and collaborative working and coaching instead of ego, just look at P Professor Schwab. He's got a, a quote which says the type of leadership that's needed. All right? So if there's nobody, if there's people, if your two people think that they've got more expertise than Professor Schwab, who advises the you know, world leaders, then I think you've got a very big problem. Yeah? But uh, that's, that's how I get around it. Yeah. I think we have time for one or two, depending on how long the questions are. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful to meet you. All right. Thank you.